from the, from the perspective of the Jewish community. So when you're going in there, you're not alone. There's others who have walked that path before you, and they will help you walk that path. And that's, by the way, not only for people who come here on Thursday night, but from people who know that there is a place like this. You know, people in the community say, wow, if the Jewish community is supporting a building and a full-time person and a program for recovering Jewish addicts, there must be a bunch of them. Because <laughs> if there's only me, and they haven't discovered me yet, why is there a building? So the very fact that this building exists, that this program exists, that is a welcoming mat, a welcoming sign to all people who are not yet in recovery and who are worried about coming in here, coming in recovery, and we allow them to come in and we guide them to recovery. This is not recovery per se. This is a gateway to recovery. We want them to go and do the real thing. And the third thing that I thought was important, which is how I started my class, was that I believe very strongly in the spirituality of the program. And I believe very strongly in the spirituality of Judaism. Most of you are familiar with the spirituality of the program. Most people, even religious people, are not very familiar with the spirituality of Judaism. But when we have, when we have, as Jewish people, our Jewish spirituality, that can have a positive impact on our recovery spirituality. And, even more, I would say, our spirituality that we gather from our recovery enhances the spirituality that we may get from our Judaism. So it's important to study about those similarities in the programs of spirituality that exist between and this book is I believe a major beginning a work that will help us view certain elements in recovery through the lens of Judaism so we'll start for those of you on the book um, hey there's Roman numerals so Roman uh, Roman numerals and then page 15 uh, I'm sorry, 13, which is, it's called Jews, Addiction, and Recovery. You got it? Yeah, it doesn't have a page number, but it, the next page has a number, and etc. So, uh, I, I announced that we're going to, to do this for 22 weeks, because there's three chapters in the Roman rules, and there's 19 chapters in the regular pages, and I was thinking about a chapter a day, but I'm thinking... We might do a little less, a little more, so we'll just get trucking, and hopefully throughout we will promote certain classes more than others when we think that there's something that the greater public uh, can uh, understand. I hope all you guys had a chance to run down the, the, um, the content uh, page, which has you know, all the chapters, and it will kind of give you uh, the, the structure of, of, of how this is going to work. Okay. So, it starts with a joke, so I'm going to read it. I'm not good at jokes. <laughs> it seems to have become part of the Jewish-American culture. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one more thing. So the point was that I think that although this book is easy to read, there's an advantage of us sitting together and reading it as a community to better live these things are written in here not only from a theological point or from a spiritual point but also from a community standpoint that we're sitting together and reading the book so like the Haggadah on Pesach like, like the Haggadah on Pesach okay good I like that it seems to have become part of the Jewish American culture imperative that Rabbi has to open his remarks with the telling of a joke usually an old and corny one preferably based on some outdated and marginally offensive cultural stereotype <laughs> At times, this may even serve as an elusive segue into a discussion of the topic at hand. So, if we were speaking on the topic of Jewish spirituality and recovery from addiction, and I wanted to conform to standard practice, I would probably start off with this oldie. A group of Jewish mothers are sitting on a bench on the boardwalk in Boca Raton, or Miami Beach, or somewhere like that, playing mahjong. I suppose. 
and talking about what else? Their children. <laughs> One says, my son just graduated law school and is in offer a position at a very prestigious firm. The other lady is all, ooh, and ah. <laughs> says another lady, my son just got his MD and he's going to intern with a top specialist in this field. The other all voiced their approval. A thirdly speaks up, my son was just ordained from rabbinical school and he's going to be the leader of a congregation. And the proud mother waits for the same spontaneous peer approval just received by her two friends. But there's nothing but an awkward silence. That is, until one of the ladies finally turns to her and says, A rabbi? What kind of profession is that for a Jewish boy? <laughs> I guess it's funny. <laughs> My point, and I have uh, my point, would you believe that what people think of as Jewish and what really is Jewish are very often two different things? <clears throat> and also, I would add, what people think of Judaism and what Judaism is, is very different things. And I, I told you the story about the rabbi who, you know, he said a joke, I have to say a joke now. <laughs> the rabbi who comes into the congregation in the first week and he talks, and then you know, the president comes over to him and says, okay, rabbi, what's, what's the sermon going to be about? He says, well, I thought I was going to talk about, you know, Sabbath. It's a universal topic. He says, you know, if, a lot of people in this congregation don't really observe the Shabbos. And if you can talk about Shabbos, some may get offended. You don't, you don't, you don't want to do that. So, okay, that's not a problem. I can talk about kosher. <laughs> he says, nah, I mean, just yesterday, I had lunch with a treasurer at... Uh, uh, we're not going to say where it was, but no, he, he's going to get majorly... He's going to think you're targeting him. Well, you know what? I'll just talk about Jewish education. Ah, Jewish education. Ah. You know what? We had so much trouble last year. There was a whole fight on the board about how exactly to do the school and this way and that way. If you talk about Jewish education, maybe they think I set it up. They might have some strife in the, com in the community and results. Don't talk about Jewish education. So they're always saying, listen, I can't talk about Shabbos. I can't talk about kosher. I can't talk about Jewish education. I'm going to assume I can't talk about assimilation, right? What do you want me to talk about? He says, what do you mean? Just talk about Judaism. <laughs> talk about Judaism. So, the point is that it's um, what we assume about certain things. And a lot of times when people learn more, they're like, oh, and I thought so and so and so and so. I said, no, just quite the opposite. Um, it is fairly common to find that something that has come to be accepted as characteristically or even quintessentially Jewish is really no more than the en enshrinement of some perceived cultural idiosyncrasy. 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 As in the old Len Lenny Bruce routine, chocolate is Jewish, part is Goyish, <laughs> food salad is Jewish. Lime jello is goyish, lime soda is very goyish. <laughs> like all stereotypes, they don't have to be true. They just have to satisfy our expectations. So basically, uh, introduction saying, what are we going to talk about? Is addiction a Jewish thing or it's not Jewish? To wit, there's an old pejorative Yiddish saying from the shtetl. Shikir is a goy. Meaning that a drunk is a non-Jew. And by implication, Jews aren't drunks. Talk about sweeping over generalizations. How this stereotype even came to be, I haven't the foggiest. Because, is it missing a word here? Foggiest idea? Oh, no. No. Okay. Understood. Understood? Okay. Because alcoholism and addiction have existed since time immemorial. And we find no real evidence, despite the persistence of the myth, myth to the contrary, that the Jewish people were ever somehow magically immune from this condition. The Torah itself speaks about it. King Solomon wrote parables about it in the book, book of Proverbs, plenty, about how a man is attached to his bottle and how it's destroying him. The Talmud discusses the legal and moral ramification of it. Are you allowed to pray if you're drunk? The Talmud discusses different levels of drunkness. Are you drunk in a way that you can still stand in front of the king? Or are you drunk like a lot who didn't realize that his daughters were sleeping with him? That's how drunk he was. Are you
you allowed to teach Torah when you're drunk? Is a Kohen allowed to do the service in the temple if he had a cup of wine? Etc., etc. The word shikr is, is, is a word in Hebrew. So it had to come from somewhere. And shikr means drunk. <laughs> Noah was drunk. So obviously, this assumption, this statement that there is no shikr, there is no drunks in the Jewish people is, is, is wrong. We have to find out when it started. It doesn't matter. Even Jewish folk tales are rife with passion, passing mention and sometimes not so passing mention of the Jewish drunks who seem to have been a common, if not a big Jewish fixture in every shadow. I mean, everyone, anyone heard about Herschel F. Stoppler, the famous Jewish character? He was an alcoholic. All the jokes about him were about how he was an alcoholic. One time, one time they, they told him that uh, uh, he has to stop drinking. He really has to stop drinking. And the doctor says, that's it. Uh, the Rebbe, he was the Rebbe's uh, shamash, and the Rebbe said, you have to make you stop drinking, so I am telling you as your doctor, no more drinking at all. That's it. Cold turkey, the Rebbe said. The Rebbe said, you got to stop. So, he stopped drinking. Within a day, he's having the DTs. And he's trembling and he's shaking. He's becoming very dangerous. He called the doctor right away and the doctor says, we got to give him some alcohol. He says, oh no. The Rebbe said, no drinking? I'm not drinking. And he argues, no, I'm the doctor. I'm telling you, you have to drink. He says, the Rebbe said, no drinking. I'm not drinking. The doctor says, listen, if you're not going to listen, I'm going to have two guys hold you down and I'm going to have a guy pour alcohol in your throat. He says, yeah, you're going to do that? He says, yeah, okay, fine. He says, I'll agree, but with one little twist, a little difference. I want one guy to hold me down and two guys to pour the alcohol. (laughs) So this is a typical Heschel-Lester polar joke. And it's been in Jewish literature, the shikr. So even the sentence, shikr is a guy, is not real. So obviously... The first thing is that alcoholism and drunkenness have always existed in the Jewish community. That's a starter. Addiction. All addictions. And I'm, I'm just going to mention food addiction because we know how central food becomes in the Jewish uh, celebration of holidays, of being a Jewish mother, of even, uh, back then, you you married somebody who was, who had put enough pounds to look good in order to, to, um, to look healthy. That was, and the mother just stuffed your throat. And there are some big rabbis and others who, who were not healthy because of how much they were eating. So that's definitely been there. Other addictions as well. So we have established that if you're an addict, you belong right in the Jewish community. There's nothing stopping you from coming in there. Now, if that little bit of cognitive dissonance wasn't enough, a new, equally unrealistic, an uninformed presumption has been born in our day and age. Not only are Jews not addicts, but also if they are, and they most certainly are not, then for sure they aren't in recovery. And by the way, when I came here eight years ago, and I started looking into the topic, Rabbi Levi Shemtov says, don't try to knock down the door that there's Jewish alcoholism, there's Jewish alcoholics, because that door was, you know, was wide, broken wide open already. No, one's gonna, no one is interested in hearing that there's Jewish alcoholics. We know that already here in this town. He says, but that there's Jewish people in recovery, that there's recovering alcoholics who are Jewish, that's something that no one talks about. And that's what we need to do in this town, to show that recovery exists in the Jewish community. So this is the second one. And believe me, for a while I thought maybe there isn't. <laughs> and there wasn't. And I met people who started 25 years ago in this town, and there really wasn't. 
I mean, isn't it bad enough to be an addict, but to sit around in some room with a bunch of other addicts talking about God? I can just imagine Lenny Bruce saying, being an addict is goyish, but being in recovery is really goyish. <laughs> Uh, there's two things here. There's, first of all, we're going to talk about ourselves. Who does that? We we shove things under the rug because we you know we don't talk about our problem. And number two is God. We don't talk. Jewish people don't talk about God. It's a Christian thing to do. Talk about God. You know the story with uh, the person is doing a survey of all the religion, and he goes to the mosque on Friday. And he taps on the shoulder of the thing. He says, do you believe in Allah? He says, yes. He says, you consider yourselves religious? He says, absolutely. I'm here. He goes to the church on Sunday. He taps on, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. You consider yourself religious? He says, sure. And he goes to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. He taps on the He says, do you believe in God? He says, well, it depends what you mean by believing. <laughs> it depends what you mean by God. It depends what you mean by you. <laughs> Do you consider yourself religious? He says, me religious? Are you crazy? I eat lobster. I do eat that. I'm not religious. He says, what are you doing here? He says, it's Yom Kippur. <laughs> That's it. So we don't talk about God. We don't talk about religion. We don't talk about that stuff. We're just Jewish. <laughs> Sitting around in a room, talking about God in the basement of a church, no, no, no less. And as I'm imagining it, it suddenly occurs to me that although it was not my conscious motivation, I'm thinking of a Jew who died of a harrowing overdose in his 40s. Unfortunately, I could make a long list of Jews who have shared a similar fate. Many were even younger than 40. I could also make a long list, thank God, of Jews who live, who lives have been saved by a program of recovery from addiction. People have literally returned from the brink of total physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual collapse. So we'll talk more about these four things later. To live happy, healthy lives of productive contentment. There are hundreds, even thousands, and I'm talking, I'm just talking about the people I know. But would either list change the popular perception? I doubt it. That's the thing about culture, cultural stereotypes. They're inherently resistant to all evidence that would cast aspersions on their veracity. They're sort of like rationalization, but on a social, societal. societal level. I love this. He has hard words. I love it. <laughs> What's a rationalization? I made up my mind. My heart is set already. And I'm going to twist my, my brain to find a logical reason for my behavior or for my decision. Don't confuse me with facts. And don't confuse me with the facts. Okay? So, there's no addicts, and there's no people, Jewish people in recovery, that's a given. The fact that there's hundreds and thousands of them, don't confuse me with the facts. The humongous irony of it all is that all of all the things a nice Jewish boy or girl could turn out to be, an addict, as we shall go on to define the term and the verb in the first few chapters of this book, is actually very Jewish. What's an addict? Anybody can guess why it's very Jewish to be an addict? Seeking that oneness, seeking that wholesomeness. No. Seeking the connection to the yearning to be one with God. The yearning to be one with God. We'll see. We'll talk about in the letter from from uh, Carl Jung about. What addiction is, what alcoholism is, is right? Which is the yearning to be. Oh, he cheated because he read the whole book already. <laughs> <laughs> the yearning to be connected to God. That's what addiction is. We'll find out some more about it. That's a Jewish thing, very Jewish thing. Being recovery, as we shall describe what that is in all of the other chapters, is very, very Jewish. <laughs> it's a very spiritual process. That is consistent with all Jewish spiritual values that may or may not be popular in the Jewish community, but nevertheless they exist and are practiced by people both in and out of recovery. This book is not an attempt to debunk every misconception that may contribute to the dangerous stigma dissuading, dissuading, dissuading mm-hmm. Jewish addicts from getting help. Because, you know, I'm involved in intervention and one of the issues of the intervention is 
you know, they're going to, to, to a rehab, they're taking in, it's all planned. Is there going to be kosher food there? So I called the rehab, I said, you know, you advertise that you provide kosher food, so what's the process? So the person gave me the process, well, thank you very much, I just want to come to these, you know, we're doing this intervention, and one of the questions that come up is going to be kosher food. And the guy says, oh, an intervention, yeah, they're going to question the weather, they're going to question the, 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 you know, the pollution in the air, they're going to, be, if, if people are looking for excuses not to go in recovery, then there's plenty out there. Kosher is one of them, but it's not the only one of them. So this book is not about trying to convince people about all the things that Jewish people are dissuaded from going and getting help. Neither, neither is it of interest to me here or in any other forum, for that matter, to try to prove with facts and figures that addiction is a disease that cuts across all demographic boundaries with respect to race, religion, economic standing. You go online, and you can Google it, and you'll find out. Or you can go to rehab, or you can go into, into, into a meeting. Okay? It's not scientific research over here. Truthfully, I find that kind of polemic to be at last rather unimportant and somehow boring. Okay. What the book is really is a collection of insights, observations, and even some humble suggestions based on the personal experiences of many people who have begun to relate more meaningfully to God and how that newfound consciousness and the lifestyle that accompanies it has changed their lives. And I'm proud to say that some people here and some of the insight that came from the meetings here and from my classes, from my head, listening to other people, all contributed to this collection of insight and observations. Because you have begun to relate more meaningfully to God and that newfound consciousness and the lifestyle that accompanies it changed your life. And when I talk to you, and I hear you, and then I talk to Rabbi Taub, and we compare notes, a lot of the stuff comes from that. Yet, by the same token, so you're in the book, yet by the same token, it's not about specific addictions, or the different kind of behaviors that we use to destroy ourselves. The common denominator of all participants in this meeting is not our addiction, but the path that we choose to recovery, the 12 steps. It's about our spiritual awakening and the kind of relationship with God we have found. So, while recounting the gory details of who, what, where, and how much may provoke the morbid curiosity of the uninitiated, it would constitute a woefully boring waste of time to those who know the problem from the inside and are now living or looking to live in the solution. And so people call me and say, Rabbi, I need a referral to a good meeting. I said, what do you mean by a good meeting? He says, well, I want to make sure it's you know, people that I can relate to. In other words, you know, I don't want to go to a meeting where from different socio-economical cultures. I said, you know what's a good meeting? A, a good meeting is a meeting where they don't tell war stories, when they talk about the solution of the problem. And I'm going to give you a couple referrals. And I don't care what the people look like. Their ages, their profession. That's a good meeting. And that's where I want you to go. Because if you're looking to socialize, my friend, you're in the wrong business. Well, you never go to a good meeting, and then go to that meeting. That's correct. That's correct, too. Thank you. We're talking about home meetings, like to people looking for a home group. I heard a great line. It says, in AA, I heard it from someone in AA, so I'm sure it applies. It says, we pick a home group. You need to pick a home group. And you need to go to it every single week. Unless there's a funeral. And it better be yours. Okay. But why all this talk about God? Is it a rabbi's attempt to conjure up a spiritual angle on the problem that is truly the domain of medicine of psychology? 
which means, is recovery really about God? Or is this a way to write a book about God and sell it to recovering addicts? Is this an angle? You know, people who write stories always want an angle. Right, Ronell? You need an angle. If not, the editor is never going to take it. What's the angle? <laughs> I always say it's the truth. <laughs> the truth is the angle. Hardly. Recovery from addiction is an inherently spiritual topic. <clears throat> and the word, the key word here is spiritual. Not religious. Spiritual. God is not religious. <clears throat> I had a long conversation with my wife last night about is God religious or not. She went to the book fair and there was a speaker that spoke. And so, I, from my experience in recovery, I knew already that God is spiritual. God is definitely not religious. Let's explain. Roman numeral 18, 17. Spiritual or religious? What is recovery? For those of us who aren't so sure of the answer, and perhaps even more important, for those of us who are quite sure that we do know the answer, Let us begin by asking the following question. What is recovery and what are the 12 steps? And I think that the parentheses over here are very important, especially to me. Um, I was taught, when I went to rabbinical school, I was taught to learn everything and to know all the answers. So by the time I become a rabbi, I can tell, answer any question and correct any problem and advise any conflict because I'm a rabbi I was driving today and the person had a license plate was know it all but there's no space on the license plate to write know it all so no was spelled N-O and I thought it was very very accurate it was very accurate know it all and my When I came here and I started encountering recovery and all that stuff, I found out that I knew nothing, which was great. But I also found out that the more I'm going to find out, the less I'm going to know. So I was, should I engage myself in a field where I'm not going to become an expert in ever, where I'm never going to know the answers? It's quite humbling when I took that step and walked in there. Not your typical, you know, not even rabbinical, but any career. Everybody wants to go in a career and say, I want to be the best I can be in that career and go to the top of the chain. But here it's, you're never going to know nothing. And the more you get into it, the less you're going to know. And the less you're going to know, the more you're going to have to listen. And listening is the hard part. But hey, I practice a lot and I hope that I live up to it. Now for the purpose of this introduction, our answer will be brief, blunt, and overly general. This is after all just an introduction. La later on, Jewish introductions, <laughs> just three chapters in the introduction, I mean. <laughs> so, how are you? How are the kids? Uh, uh, uh. After an hour and a half. So, I was calling you <laughs> about this project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, after all, just an introduction. Later on in the book, we'll have some time to look at detail and nuance, but not here and not now. Ready for the brief, blunt, and overly general answer to our question, what is recovery and what are the 12 steps? And to us, we're sitting here, uh, we know most of it. I'm just going to run through it for those of you who are not really familiar with the details. Uh, but this is a, a, a basically a short history of AA. Here it is. The modern social phenomenon properly known as the recovery movement started not so very long ago in, in terms of how long there's been addiction in the world. Uh, with the advent of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935, 
By the end of that decade, in the fifth year of the group's formal existence, A published what continues to this day to be its primary text, the book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, which then carried the now anachronistic subtitle The Story of How More Than 100 Men Have Recovered from Alcoholism. A hundred people recovered. It was a huge news back then. It was this first A publication today more properly known in the recovery circles as the Big Book that actually gave birth to the 12 steps and first formally enumerated them. The founders of AA had struck upon a way of life that enabled them to remain happily sober and they devoted themselves to teaching others the lesson they had only learned after much grueling trial and error. It became clear that the program could be taught to others, but being transmitted by word of mouth as it was, it didn't travel very well. In an attempt to disseminate the program far and wide, the book was written. It was this book, a, a aforementioned big book that took what essentially had been an oral tradition. It sounds familiar, right? Like the Torah. For a relatively small band of adherents and codified it as a course of clearly defined actions for others. When put into writing for the first time, there emerged 12 basic actions known as steps, which made the basis of the program. The book accomplished its intended objective incredibly quickly, within a matter of 10 to 15 years in fact, and by the 1950s, groups all over the world practiced a standardized version of the program and its steps. Roughly at the same juncture, something else began happening. Something that had not realistically been anticipated by anybody. And originally when they, you know, they started the program. The same 12 steps that worked for alcoholics began to be adopted as a model of living by people struggling with addiction and disorders other than alcoholism. The first occurrence of a spin-off of AA took place, perhaps not so surprisingly, among the group most closely associated with alcoholics. We refer, of course, to the founding of the group al as a program of recovery for the friends and family of alcoholics in 1951. As for the need for friends and families to have their own program of recovery, see part 5, which is entirely devoted to addressing the subject of codependency. This is going to be, I think, the first time that we're going to give a class on Judaism and codependency. Way overdue. Because Judaism... <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, we invented it. Then came Narcotics, Narcotics Anonymous in 1953, Gamblers Anonymous in 1957, and Overeaters Anonymous in 1960. The decade in which AA sold its one millionth copy of the book, the 1970s, also saw the founding of separate 12 step program for debtors and sex addicts. Today, there are literally dozens of various 12 step groups with millions of members worldwide. Although they give, to give exact numbers is impossible because of a matter of policy, these self-proclaimed anonymous groups keep no formal membership records. And if you want to go on page uh, appendix A, on page 181, has a list of some A meetings, like NAIL. Do you know what NAIL is? Neurotics Anonymous. Neurotics? Yeah. yeah. NAIL. Or NICA. Nicotine Anonymous. There's some... Spa, Social Phobics Anonymous. Like Olga. Olga, you like Olga? I'm <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Um, CMA, Crystal Meth Anonymous. CLA, Clutter Anonymous. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point, ooh, the point is that maybe this book is going to be talking a lot about AA, but... That's not the point, because the common denominator of all participants in this meeting is not addiction, but the path that you choose to recover the 12 steps. Okay? So, if you're coming here and you don't associate yourself with AA, you don't relate to AA, we're not going to repeatedly again and again and again. Sometimes there will be certain issues where specific other addictions are very more associated with the subject, and we'll talk about them, but mostly we'll talk about the AA as a general way to talk about the 12-step movement, the 12-step program, and the spirituality of recovery. So, I invite you to join me for the next 21 weeks. We will, I think we will break for Thanksgiving, I assume, right? No one wants to eat chicken with me on Thanksgiving. <laughs> you want to eat turkey. Um, yes. So, welcome, and if you didn't buy the book yet, go to Kobe's and get it for $15. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,